His uncompromising political views and retiring personality led him to be the least known member of Les Cis, and the only one to officially quit the group. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're talking about Louis Dure. Louis Dure was born in May 1888, making him the oldest of Les Cis's members and the oldest of three brothers. Early in his life, he was against the idea of learning to play the piano, as eight-year-old Louis believed that it was not for his gender. Musical instruments had, through the course of Western history, adopted certain gendered affectations. The piano and the flute and the harp were considered more feminine pursuits, whereas other instruments, like the clarinet or the cello, would have been scandalous in certain eras and circles for a woman to play. Louis, as much as an eight-year-old could have a philosophy, seemed to go along with this, but it also could have just as easily been an excuse for him to not study music and instead go into the family's printing business. His youngest brother, Pierre, would do just this. Music broadly wasn't gendered, and the Durais made a habit of going to the opera, where in November 1907, at the age of 19, Louis Durais saw Claude Debussy's opera Pelias et Melisande. Pelias was an embodiment of the anti-Wagnerian ethos present in Debussy and throughout the Impressionist movement within music, as his intimacy is anathema to the massive productions of something like the Ring Cycle. Duray, after attending that opera, decided then and there that he was going to become a composer. So he finished off his in-progress engineering degree and studied privately with a professor who taught at the Scala Cantorum. Some sources will state that he studied at the Scala Cantorum, but this isn't accurate. He studied with a professor who taught there. So smitten was Jure with Pelias that he never missed a performance of it from when he first heard it up until World War I, a period of seven years. It took until 1914 before Jure was able to write something halfway decent. Teaching composition in those days was about drilling the basics for years before you could write your own stuff. He began composing music for The Voice, and even though it had been seven years since he first saw Pelias, he hadn't expanded beyond his love of Debussy. These early pieces are very much in the Debussyan tradition. What broke Debussy's hold on his creative consciousness was Arnold Schoenberg. Schoenberg had already produced a series of astonishingly forward-thinking pieces, such as his progressively atonal second string quartet of 1908 and his fully atonal Pierrot Lunaire, in 1912. Duray's exposure to Schoenberg was through an excerpt from the 1909 song cycle Das Buch der Hangenden Garten, or The Book of the Hanging Gardens, which inspired Duray's own Offrande Lyrique. Duray's position in the chronology of French music is far ahead of his time. He was influenced by this Viennese composer right when World War I flared up, and anti-German sentiments within the Entente powers, and in France specifically, was at an all-time high. Duray cited this tiny, tiny Schoenberg excerpt as something that gave him permission to go beyond the harmonies of Debussy, it opened up an entirely new world to him. Consider that he didn't actually hear a full performance of this piece until 1966. There was a great amount of harmonic freedom in Schoenberg's early atonal but not yet 12-tone works that Duray latched onto. After 16 months of service in World War I, Duray returned to civilian life with an itch to compose, and he was quite prolific for the next period of his career. 1916 through 1929 was a period of what he called multifaceted continuity, where he wanted to do something different with each piece. He also valued smaller forms and the intimacy of expression within the French tradition, dating back to the harpsichord pieces of Francois Couperin. For this reason, he only ever completed one opera and a few scattered orchestral accompaniments or orchestrations. Duray's multifaceted approach led him to embrace, albeit without its characteristic sharpness, the style of Igor Stravinsky, which Maurice Ravel noted in Duray's Caridon, or Bells, the first Duray piece ever published. Duray held a particular affinity for Ravel and cherished the elder composer's songs. One story that highlights the differences between different composers of Les Cis was the time that Duray and Francis Poulenc decided that they were going to set the same poems from Guillaume Apollinaire's Le Bestiaire. Duray set all of the poems, while Poulenc, on the advice of Georges Auric, with whom he was close, called a setting down to six. When Poulenc got word of Duray's setting, he dedicated his settings to Duray, 
a gesture of acknowledgement, it would seem, as Poulenc and Duray were not especially close. This period is where you pick up on Duray's politics, which were already leaning towards the hard left, and particularly towards the ideology of Jean Jaurès, an unorthodox communist whose opposition to the war had led to his assassination. Duray, in the face of a growing, seething hatred of all things German, turned towards some German writers for inspiration. Duray was still quite enthralled with Debussy, particularly his style of orchestration. For his saint jean paul setting Eloge, the strings of the unusual ensemble Duray uses, vocal quartet, wind and string quintets, harp and percussion, occupy a background role, while the other instruments take on a more foreground role. This style is pretty much Debussy's standard orchestral approach. Instead of the German style, which would be treating the strings as the base of the orchestration and everything else as color on top of that. Not to mention his use of modal melodies, something that Debussy had in common with Maurice Ravel. Jean Cocteau, who styled himself as Les Cis's impresario and theoretician, was against string instruments for their romantic bent and sketched out a future of French music that dispensed with them entirely. But Duray embraced string instruments and in an impressionist way at that. In 1917, he wrote a string quartet dedicated to Georges Auric. Such was the nature of the friendships that held together Les Cis. Auric could be, completely unironically, the dedicatee of Cocteau's tract Le Coq et l'Anacroix, which laid out the ideology of the group, and he could also be the dedicatee of a piece which threw that ideology back in Cocteau's face. The stark bitonality of Duray's first quartet and the genre itself is reminiscent of Darius Mio's use of the technique and his 18 quartets, although the similarities in there. Mio's music tends to be a lot more lighthearted and cheery, while Duray's, despite his stated and probably best intentions, takes after Ravel in a lot of ways. When Mio returned from Brazil in 1919, he was immediately welcomed back into the group, and there he probably met Duray for the first time, although nailing down exactly when two members of Lestis met for the first time it can be a little bit difficult. And although they had not known one another for very long, when Mio had a typically violent Parisian premiere in 1920, Duray got so incensed that he slapped one of the boobirds, a local organist named Jules Franck, across the face. Duray always emphasized the friendships within the group, but was keen to differentiate themselves ideologically. Duray was similar to Arthur Onager, in that his aesthetic values and sentiments were set apart from the group's overall ideology. Oniger was, after all, the only member of the group not to be a Satie fan. Nonetheless, the differences that Duray had with the rest of the group, particularly his affinity for Ravel, which he shared with Germain Théaffaire, was something that he took more personally. Duray and Théaffaire represented the two composers most associated with suburban France, and they both had more of a sympathy for Debussy and Ravel than the other members. Duray was unique within the group because even though he made it clear that Lécis did not share an ideology, he saw Lécis as an institution, as a much more rigid ideological framework than he was comfortable with. Perhaps it was his role in both Lécis and in its predecessor group, Satie's New Youths. He was the secretary in both of these cases. His discomfort in working in large dramatic forms, the strong anti-impressionist bent among some of Lécis, and what he saw as Jean Cocteau's more outlandish artistic impulses all led him to quit the group in 1921. He abandoned a collaborative ballet project with the other five at the last minute, and it forced them into an awkward position of having to cover his part of the ballet score. Because his individual friendships continued, dropping out of Lécis was more about him and Cocteau not seeing eye to eye than much of anything else. After his withdrawal from the group, Duray settled down in Saint-Tropez and was rarely heard from again. He led a life there that many have described as monastic, although he would not make that his permanent residence for another 40 years. The birth of his daughter Arlette and his subsequent return to Paris from Saint-Tropez in 1930 brought a slowing down of his compositional production. He was unable to be financially secure just off of composing, and so he turned to editing scores in order to make more money. Sporadic composition would define his creative life up until 1937, when the specter of war and then the outbreak of World War II prevented him from composing at all until France was liberated. The finishing touches on his triptych Calandria des Enfants coincided with 
and increased political radicalization. Now, Duray was not unique among les Cis for his affinity for leftist politics, nor was he the only one to join the Communist Party. The difference is when Taillefer joined in the late 1960s, she did it for more complicated reasons. Whereas Duray, well, he was ideologically committed to the ideas of communism. Taillefer's later membership didn't affect her music or her reception in any special way, whereas Duray's choice to join the party definitely did. He composed a pair of songs on texts by Ho Chi Minh, who had lived in Paris between 1917 and 1923, as Duray was disgusted at France's treatment of what would become Vietnam and wanted to express his solidarity with what he saw as the freedom fighters of that country. He also set excerpts of Mao Zedong's Long March and composed a pro-North African independence cantata in 1952, which had to be rehearsed in secret when the authorities got wind of its revolutionary subject matter. During World War II, Duray stuck it out in occupied France. He transcribed Renaissance music, updating it to fit new notation and just to save it. After all, there was a world war going on. While he was helping to save old scores, particularly those of Clément Janequin, Duray was actively involved in the French Resistance, although the details of his involvement here are vague. Duray was the only member of Les Cis never to be interviewed on the radio, and most of the information we have about him come from first-hand sources. Sources so close to Duray that, regardless of their attempts to be objective, their objectivity must be called into question. The immediate post-war years saw a hostile environment to performances of his pieces on texts of far-left revolutionaries. Conservative audiences were not willing to touch these pieces with a 10-foot pole, and we have to keep in mind that during the early days of the Cold War, this is the same time that the CIA was secretly funding concerts of avant-garde music specifically against the communist dictatorships and their ideological ideas of what art and music should be. In the West, a wholehearted embrace of Anton Webern's style of serialism was spearheaded by Pierre Boulez. In sharp contrast to Les Cis's belief in a French musical tradition, Boulez didn't think that such a tradition existed at all. With the culture against him and his music still not very well known, Duray once again underwent a stylistic shift in his music in the 1950s and began composing absolute music, something that would define his music for the rest of his career. This is music that's not based on anything. It's just music for the sake of itself. He was still so quiet and closed off that for a while, Teofer lived within about 100 feet of his house. And yet, except for the times that they would run into each other at the market, they didn't really interact all that much. And you'd think that her joining of the French Communist Party in 1968 would have been of deep interest to Duray. There's no evidence to suggest that he even knew that she did this. Ironically, although he had retired to Saint-Tropez permanently in 1959 after the destruction of his family's estate in Paris, the final decade and a half of Duray's life was a series of honors, as French music looked back upon the tumultuous half-century that had preceded it and wanted to honor all of the musicians that had been a part of it. Since Duray had been a member of Les Cis, he was so honored. Duray composed until 1974 and died at the age of 91 in July 1979. Teofer also lived until the age of 91, but she was born later, so she outlived him. Somewhat similar to César Cui's role in the Russian Mighty Handful, to which Les Cis were initially compared and so named, he is the least known of his group. It must be noted, though, that the reason that Duray is known at all is because he was very briefly, a member of Les Cis. I guess you could say he's sort of the uh, Pete Best of Les Cis in a way. Duray was very timid, which he thought of as his own personal modesty. Had not Frederick Robert, Duray's colleague and friend, not become interested in Duray's music, Duray said, this is according to Robert, that he would have burned all of his manuscripts. He was, despite his obscurity, quite a prolific composer, clocking in at 116 opuses. There are two, let's say two and a half problems, when it comes to Duray in the canon, because he's not played all that much. The first, quite simply, is he wasn't a big fan of self-promotion. He was modest and he was timid, and throughout the history of music you see that composers who do not promote themselves do not end up having that big of a place in the repertoire. You have to put yourself out there and promote yourself as much as you can if you have any hope of being remembered, especially after your death. He showed up to Lacey's reunions and concerts out of an obligation to his friends, 
not out of his desire to use Lécis as the platform for building up a career, as other composers, such as Mio, chose to do. The second problem is his choice to do different things, which reflect a different aspect of his personality. His intentional choice to be multifaceted ended up working against him. Some scholars who have been interested in Duray's music have tried to divvy up his collected work into three successive periods, somewhat cribbed from the Beethoven scholarship, to be quite honest with you. But the problem with that is that he didn't do just one thing either. If you're not well known, you kind of have to be known for doing one thing in order to be known. And he didn't have a one thing that he did. He was just a member of Lécis for a little bit. It's hard to pin him down without unnecessary stereotyping. And the one thing you can sort of nail him down on is the one thing that's not going to make any of his most significant texts sung. It's the communism again. And look, I, I keep going back to it, but listen, if you thought during the Chinese Civil War that the communists had the right idea, it makes sense that you would want to set poems and texts about that cause and in support of that cause. But once he became a dictatorial chairman whose policies of the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution killed, starved, maimed, tortured, and displaced millions upon millions of people for no good reason, it's hard to justify <laughs> the lauding of his writings in song. His policies, even by the modern Chinese Communist Party, have been repudiated as a really bad idea. Frankly, there's only a certain kind of very narrow historical revisionist who would be interested in singing, playing, or hearing these songs for any reason other than historical curiosity. Some of those narrow revisionists might be down in my comments section right now. Ooh, let's take a look. In the end though, look, I don't want to leave this as the last taste in your mouth regarding DeRay, regardless of what the title of this video is. His music is incredibly multifaceted and it's incredibly well-crafted. And if you like Ravel and his penchant for modality, you're gonna find something to enjoy in DeRay as well. In fact, I would say if you like Ravel, Dere is probably the member of Les Cis that you will consistently enjoy the most. For instance, his songs are often accompanied by unusual ensembles, evoking Ravel's three poems of Stéphane Mallarmé. It's really a shame that so much of his music still languishes in obscurity because he deserves so much more than the fate of merely being the sixth of Les Cis. Mm -hmm.